and cover how the brain works and uh, how its its activity spreads over the brain it's certainly very useful to have a map of uh, of the the connections and um, oops let's see how long here yes so uh, that just a, a short definition so the the connectome is what we understand as a comprehensive map of neural connections in the brain. Um, it's really the, 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 the map uh, telling us uh, what is connected with what. However, with the, the notion of connectome, automatically we, we have to consider the scales at which we, the level at which we, we are describing this map. Um, Naturally, we would be we would be inclined in describing connectivity at the cellular level, um, describing every single neuron or even glial cell. But of course, given the the, the complexity and the, the size uh, of the brain in terms of neuronal elements, uh, this is uh, impossible at the at the global level. You might be able to do that. At a very local level, and describe this at the level of a of a microcolon or a little piece of cortex, but certainly not over the entire brain. And this is why we we have to agree on what scale we we this we describe brain connectivity. The the level at which we are going to focus during these two days is the so-called macroscopic connectivity level, macroscopic scale. And uh, in, this in this historic illustration uh, from Vendel Creek, uh, you see about the, the level of description at, what, at which we are going to focus. So what we consider connectivity is basically white matter bundles um, that uh, coherently travel through the brain from one piece of gray matter to another one. Huh? So the, the scale here is millimeters or even several millimeters uh, of axonal bund diameters of axonal bundles. So here, just an example from this uh, nice drawing, we can already suppose or infer that there are white matter tracts in red, for example, that correspond to the cortical spinal tract running from the motor cortex down into the spinal cord or callosal decusation fibers here uh, in green. These, even at the macroscopic level, these fiber tracts um, are pretty numerous. And uh, we need a consistent and mathematically practical way to, to describe brain connectivity. A na very natural way to do that is to, to represent brain connectivity as a connection matrix, like the one I illustrate here in front uh, in this slide. So in this schematic, you have here a color code referring to different brain areas that you find again on the lines and columns of this matrix. And if we if we zoom in, we, we we see that we see the description that we have. So uh, you have got indices describing some piece of, of cortex on the on in, line, in terms of lines and columns, and uh, at the intersection, you will find a measure of brain connectivity. Of course. Um, ideally, we would like to have information like uh, number of axons, or conduction speed, or level of coupling. Uh, however, as you will see, uh, we will have much more, um, much much more high level or descriptive ways to describe connectivity with measure coming from MRI. So how do we get from uh, how do we get such connectivity matrix in a from a human subject 
uh, human living subject. So the steps that we have described quite a few years ago, uh, I think still apply. Of course, technology has improved. Uh, we are able to do it in more accurate ways than, than 15 years ago. Nevertheless, this, uh, the schematic is still the same. Uh, so first of all, the subject of interest needs to lie in an MR scanner and uh, we are going to run an, MR, an MRI acquisition. This MRI acquisition will need at least two types of sequences. So first of all, um, a T1 weighted high resolution um, MRI of the brain. And on the other hand, some type of diffusion imaging uh, needs to be done as well. You will hear about the, detailed, the details of the types of diffusion acquisition that can be collected in, in, in the next talk. From this diffusion data, you can uh, reconstruct or observe, uh, infer a diffusion orientation profiles in every voxel of the brain. I will say a few more a bit later. And from there, you can do tractography. That's one path here. And on the other hand, from the, the high resolution T1 weighted image, you you use segmentation algorithm in order to identify voxels that correspond to gray matter and differentiate them from white matter. And then with some anatomical prior, you can group those voxels into anatomically relevant regions, big regions like here that corresponds to gyri or higher resolution uh, partition of the gray matter into small patches than you see here. Those patches will be regions of interest. And then combining the tractography result with this partition, you are able to build a connectivity map where every node of your graph is going to represent a little region of interest. And the edges basically code the level of connectivity between two pairs of region of interest. Why? Is diffusion imaging the modality of choice to map white matter axons and connectivity? Well, this uh, relies on some fundamental physics. So if you recall your bachelor class of uh, physics, you probably have heard about um, Brownian motion. So Brownian motion is simply the random motion that water molecules undergo because uh, of thermal, thermal energy. Huh? Every water molecule in a system, uh, uh, in a fluid system, travels randomly over time. And uh, this can, can be described at the population level as a, uh, as a probability density function that describes basically the distribution of displacement of, of water molecules over time. So let's imagine that you are studying water displacement in a small glass of water, and you, you fix the diffusion time for, let's say, a few milliseconds. Then after a few milliseconds of uh, displacement time, many molecules will not have undergone any net displacement. Some will have gone undergone some displacement R, and very few will have traveled very far away. Now, this type of observation can also, are also possible uh, in, uh, in, in, in heterogeneous media, uh, not like a, water of, a glass of water, but maybe some biological tissue, or even some brain tissue where you have got uh, highly, uh, highly organized structures like axons and with extracellular compartment, intracellular compartment, you see readily here that compartments are, have got some orientation, right? It seems pretty intuitive that water molecules will be able to travel more easily along the axons than uh, 
perpendicular to their uh, mining sheet. By, by, the, by the time we know that main, main cellular constituents that limit water molecule diffusion are myelin, cellular membranes, and also neurofilaments and microtubules. So if we, let's now uh, consider that we are, look, we are looking at one little cube of tissue, like uh, one millimeter cube of, of tissue of different types. Here you've got examples, schematic examples of different tissue types. Here, a uh, uh, random organization of isotropic cells. Here, a uh, random organizations of, of uh, random organization of random tubes, like axons, for example. Here, coherently oriented tubes that can be white matter axons, could, could be muscle as well here. And here, finally, a more complex structure where we have got within this voxel of examination, uh, axonal fibers that cross in different ways. This could be, by the way, also, you would find similar organization, for example, if you would image the tongue of somebody where you will find crossing muscle fibers. The underlying average diffusion function, so this one here, but uh, represented in three dimension, will take a different shape. Here in, those, in these two configurations here, A, you will see that on average, um, diffusion will be restricted, but it will, it will have no orientational bias. It will be the same probability to move in any direction of space. On the other hand, if you know, if, tissues, if tissue is oriented in, a, in this way, the probability density function of diffusion will take the shape and reflect the shape of the underlying tissue structure. The same if you get more complex tissue like these crossing fibers here. So <clears throat> if we do diffusion imaging, apply some clever reconstruction method that uh, Marco will tell you about later and plot it in a coronal slide across the brain, you will get an image like this one. So this is a, a cut through uh, an, imaging, an imaged brain uh, in a cranial codal way. And you readily see that in every voxel we have mapped such a diffusion function and we see naturally that there is orientation, there is organization. Here we have got fibers orient diffusion or diffusion is oriented from left to right here from cranial to caudal and here maybe in green coming out of the screen so we naturally feel following these orientations of maximal diffusion and infer axonal fiber pathways mm -hmm. and this is actually exactly what tractography does tractography is nothing else than a, a very simple algorithm that is following um, coherent maximal diffusion across the brain. Here, an example of the of a corticospinal tract reconstructed from the diffusion data. And this can be run specifically, starting in one region, and you say, okay, show me how diffusion Let's follow diffusion from this starting point and you will get a reconstructed tract like this. And then from another starting point, you will get another reconstructed tract. And but you can do this all over the brain for all regions of interest that you have seen before from every part, every starting point in the brain. And then you, you get this kind of nice, nice image, a nice spaghetti plate, as I like to say, where you have got lots of fibers reconstruction, each of these fiber representing um, uh, a fiber tract, a large number of axons traveling coherently across the brain from one brain from one region to the other. Color here is just a way to help reading the image, where red codes for fiber that have an average direction from left to right, green anteroposterior, and blue uh, craniocaudal. Now that we have got this nice spaghetti plate, we have to focus a bit more on the gray matter parcellation. 
And there are very good algorithms nowadays um, that do that for you. That not only differentiate gray matter from white matter, but then also basically subdivide gray matter uh, with uh, uh, anatomical priors. As you see here, we have got cortex, we have got striatum, we have got thalamus. Thalamus can even be subdivided in its different subnuclei. We have the brainstem. <clears throat> and as I was mentioning, the cortex can be uh, partitioned in different levels of granularity, depending of what you want to do and what you want to study. Um, here, by the way, you have a link to an online uh, tool that you can download that does that for you very easily. So now that we we have this partition of gray matter in this different in this in the set of regions of interest, that we have got um, uh, fiber tracts all over the brain, we can combine both together and get a network representation of brain connectivity. As I, was, as I was saying before, every node here is one little piece of gray matter of the size that you want. And the edges represent the measure of connectivity derived from tractography. There is almost an infinite number of possibilities in terms of, of scale at which you want to work. Of course, the more, the more regions of interest you will have, the higher the connectivity matrix uh, will be uh, that you will have to work with. Mm -hmm. And nat naturally, you think I would like the highest resolution connectivity matrix because this is going to the most detail, but this comes with some problems uh, that, that makes that it's not necessarily the best choice for your study. As you see here, uh, very briefly, and reported in, in, this, in this study in more details, the higher the resolution of your connectivity matrix, the lower the uh, reproducibility of your connectivity is going to be. Huh? It's like in imaging in general, if you get higher resolution, usually this, this buys you some uh, signal to noise ratio. And, um, what you gain in, in, in anatomical detail, you may lose in terms of, of sensitivity. So there is a trade-off to be made there. As I was telling you, uh, naturally, you would like to have information in, uh, of connectivity in terms of number of axons, in terms of level of myelination, in, uh, in terms of conduction speed, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, MRI doesn't give you this uh, in a very easy way. So what you get usually from, from, um, from MRI are uh, semi-quantitative measures uh, or qualitative measures of connectivity that are dependent on the diffusion contrast, for example, like the apparent diffusion coefficient or the fraction of anisotropy. Of course, you can also extract information from other, other type of images that give you information about T1 relaxation, T2 relaxation, magnetic transfer, and things like that. And um, th this, uh, these measures are only to some extent related to, the, to uh, these biological factors that you are really interested in, like number of fibers of myelination. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, there is a link between them that many people are studying still now, and they are, I think they are, they are relevant. And you can choose different type of contrast and then make a, con a connectivity matrix accordingly, a fractional anisotropy connectivity matrix, an ADC connectivity matrix, or just simply count, count the number of fibers that the algorithm has generated uh, connecting two regions, but keeping in mind that this has no direct relation with the number of, of accents of a given tract. So in, in, uh, to recap, to build the connectome, uh, its methods is pretty streamlined nowadays. Uh, you need 
uh, diffusion imaging of some type, you need a high resolution anatomical method, and then uh, use segmentation and tractographs to combine all this to come up with a connectivity matrix. In the old days, this was homemade code. Uh, everybody had its own solution. Nowadays, there are several, uh, several software packages that allow to do this in a quite efficient and robust way. The one that we are developing within the Synergia Consortium is called Connecto Mapper. You will hear quite a bit more about it uh, today. It's a fully open source software um, that is uh, where the code is available. There are also different uh, container uh, available. It's a fully integrated method, as you can see here, that is able to handle uh, all steps of pre-processing of diffusion imaging, doing high quality anatomical parcellation. It's even able to, uh, to take into uh, to, to process resting state fMRI data to get functional connectivity. You can work with uh, a graphical user interface, or if you prefer, you can also simply shell script the, 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 your, your commands as you want. So we will hear about this a bit later on. And anyway, once you have done that on your data, you are ready to do proper analysis of your brain connectivity. And um, again, this will be uh, described in more details, I think, tomorrow in a, in a couple of lectures. But this is where really uh, investigation starts and, and, and discovery uh, starts. You can start, you can investigate this connectivity matrix in different ways, compare between patients, controls, the correlations with neuropsych or whatever, and uh, that's it. So there is just a, one last topic that I want to briefly touch here, because I know that this is something that probably quite a few of you have as a question in the back of their mind, is the question of of validation. Indeed, validating tractography or brain connectivity is a complicated problem made for one simple reason is that we do know not have a gold standard, right? I mean, if you want, if you develop a new technology to, to image uh, the skeleton, uh, it's pretty easy. You have got enough post-mortem study that allow you to, to validate whether the images you get correlate or not with the, with, the, with the reality. For the brain, it's completely different. There is no proper way, there is no gold standard method to map the entire brain connectivity as a whole. And um, this has uh, attracted a lot of criticism uh, from a neuroanatomist on on this uh, on on the on this type of methods, and uh, the, the reaction from the community was to to um, try to to answer to those questions in a differentiated approach, and I'm just going to mention a few of those. So one way to um, one way to, uh, to to approach validation is to to uh, to create phantoms of connectivity. Huh? So the idea is to create phantoms of connectivity and, uh, and then do diffusion imaging on this phantom and then see whether the reconstructed tracts um, correspond to the ones that have generated the, the diffusion process in that phantom. Uh, this has been done in different challenges and allowed to describe uh, the, the caveats and the performance in such simplified systems. Say. Other approaches uh, which, which are uh, somehow related is to, to extract some well-known fiber bundles uh, from diffusion imaging data. This type of fiber bundles are pretty well-known from other type of studies like anatomical this dissection or chemical uh, uh, tracing, 
and then basically recreate the diffusion signal from those tracts and then test several tracking algorithms on this, on this uh, uh, synthetic diffusion data and analyze performance of tractography in, in this way. The approach that we took uh, a few years ago, and it's only a partial response to the problem, was to use uh, animal data. And what we did, uh, we scanned um, uh, a, 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 a fixed macaque brain with diffusion imaging and did tractography on that and uh, constructed a connectivity matrix that is represented with this lower triangle matrix here and compared this with um, a meta-analysis of macaque brain connectivity uh, that has been uh, done on chemical tracing. And this is summarized with this upper triangular matrix. And basically we, we compared the, the results between this single subject diffusion experiment with a meta-analysis of chemical tracing in the, in the macaque. And we saw that uh, there, is, uh, there is correlation, although certainly not perfect, but we see that uh, tractography in this experiment uh, was able to find about 80% of the known tracts in the macaque. It also found 15% um, of tracts that are not known, so we don't know if they, they exist or not, but tractography found it. And finally, uh, tractography found 6% of connections that are known to be absent in, 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 in the macaque. So these are really true false positives. Last approach that can be taken is to compare different modalities that uh, um, map connectivity uh, in the human brain. So here we, what we did, we did structural connectivity mapping with the methodology that I just, that just described to you. And at the same time, we acquired resting state data on the same subject and calculated functional connectivity from this, from this data, and then proceeded with a simple, simple correlation uh, of connectivity values between uh, non-zero structural connections and the, the functional counterpart. And we see that these two independent methods have got quite some degree of correlation, giving additional confidence that both of these methods uh, are sensitive to something that is uh, real and biologically relevant. So with that, I think I'm, I'm done here with this first lecture. Um, uh, again, I want to thank very warmly the entire team that is behind this summer school and, not all, and also behind all the research that has been uh, done over the, the last four or five years. So thank you very much to all the, to you, since uh, without you, nothing would have happened today. Thank you.